Good morning, everybody. So this week is a continuation of the message that I started sharing with you last week. And um, so what I'm doing is I'm going through what the Word of God says about the works of the devil, about curses, about all that type of stuff, and how it practically affects people's lives. So my purpose today is not to try and prove to you that these things are real, because I feel like by now you should understand that they are, and you should understand that these things have a lot of power and influence over people's lives. I want to ask you just one question. <clears throat> I'm sure all of you tend to study people. You know, we all like that. At work, you see this one, and you see that one, and you, over time, you notice their lives, and you notice where they're going. Have you noticed that some people seem to be doing a lot better than others? Have you noticed that some people, whatever they do seems to work, and then you get the other crowd that no matter what they do, everything just seems to go wrong? Hey, I'm getting very little response from you. Okay. <clears throat> so now, here's the thing. Here's what I want you to understand. This is not random. There's reasons for that. The Bible makes it very clear that there are two supernatural powers that can be at work in the lives of people. From a biblical point of view, there are blessings and there are curses. They are real. And when the blessing of God is upon the life of an individual, you see the power of God's blessing upon that individual. But when the blessing of God is absent, you can definitely see the effects of the curse at work in the lives of an individual. So why is that important for us to take note of? Because these things are still real. They are still relative. Um, they still have power and influence over people's lives. And if we don't know what to do about it, then we are going to suffer. There's a scripture that is used a lot, and I would like to use it again today. The Bible says to us clearly, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. Hosea 4 verse 6. My people. God's people perish because they have a lack of the correct knowledge. And the way I like to look at it is we don't understand the principles of the kingdom of God. And because we don't understand the principles of the kingdom of God, we can't apply them correctly. You know, they say, I, I see many times when we watch movies, somebody gets caught out in, in the United States and they complain and then they tell them straight, ignorance is no excuse for breaking the law. The spirit world works a little bit similar to that. Sometimes we are suffering because in some instances we have overstepped boundaries that we never should have, and now there are consequences and we are suffering, and we are complaining to God that we are suffering, but God's only answer to us can really be, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So, <clears throat> last week, I started off by showing you Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 15. Cursed is the man who carves an image or casts an idol, a thing detestable to the Lord, the work of a craftsman's hands, and sets it up in secret. A lot of people have images of false gods in their homes. I want to remind you that the Word of God says, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Who can I use as an example? Um, no, no. You love your wife, don't you? She's beautiful in your eyes, isn't she? She's perfect. I mean, don't think too much because you're going to start hyperventilating. Yeah, right? But now the thing is, if, if, some, if, if your wife has a photo of another man next to the bed, is that going to go down well with you? Not well at all. Okay, so Carmen, just so that you can understand, don't even go there. Or even <laughs> Why is it so difficult for us to understand that God says this is not right? You can't be, I'm serving God, I'm worshiping God, but I got the Buddha there, and I've got the Krishna there, and I've got Kali there, and I've got Shiva there, and I've, you know, because they're going to bring me good luck, or they're going to help me, or they're going to protect me. People, I'm sorry, but that's just wrong. In fact, it's wrong on so many levels, and then the Word of God tells us, cursed is the man who brings these things into the house. What about that is difficult to understand? But even though it's not difficult to understand, how many Christians worldwide today are pushing the boundaries of the grace of God and the mercy of God by having these things all over the place? 
A lot of people bring and invite a lot of really destructive powers into their lives by not honoring the Word of God. And we're not going to argue this point. There's nothing to argue. It's plain. It's simple. Cursed is the man who brings graven images of false gods into their dwelling. I think for us, it's a very difficult concept to understand that this little trinket that I'm putting there on the mantelpiece is going to have the power to destroy me. It's not the trinket. It's your disobedience to the Word of God that is allowing that evil force to come because God's Word says, don't do it. Tony. Tony Kitchen. Let me just be clear. <clears throat> on, on my phone, you are Tony Kitchen. <laughs> so, so that I know. Your topic was quite harsh. When he said no and you didn't do what he said, what was going to happen? Well, you would have probably developed a cauliflower ear or something because you're going to get a club. Ladies and gentlemen, we understand that down here when we don't obey the rules or when we are disobedient in some way, there is always consequences. Then why is it so difficult for us to understand that our Father in heaven operates in the same way? He warns us that if we do certain things, there will be consequences. A lot of people don't believe in the boogeyman. They don't believe in fairies. They don't believe in any of this stuff. But you need to believe in the Bible. Because what God says is true. And it will come to pass. So, <clears throat> today, I want to look at what we ended off with last week. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 31 says, Do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists, for you will be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Listen carefully. Do not. Do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists, for you will be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. I have been in the ministry now for 25 years, give or take. It's a long time. And in this ministry, I have prayed for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people. And I can tell you something, this is a huge problem in the church. Because a lot of people in the church are still involved with some form of spiritism. You cannot serve God where you've committed your life to God and you said, Lord, I, I bow to you. I am your child. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. You are my God. The Holy Spirit is my teacher. But then you run to demons to get information about your life, about your future, about your destiny. Your destiny belongs to God. But a lot of people defile their destiny by running to the forces of evil to find out what is in my future. Satan cannot tell you what is in your future. He does not have access to the realm of the future. Oh, but Rian, you're wrong. He knows everything. No, he doesn't. Explain to me something. If the devil knew the future, why did he have to send the wise men to go and find out why did he want to understand from them where was the Son of God born? If he understood the future, he would have known to go to a small little um, uh, uh, stable in Bethlehem, and he would have found Jesus there, but he didn't know. Hello? So if he didn't know this elementary thing, then how does he know what's going to happen in your life tomorrow? The fact is he doesn't, but he can lie very well. In fact, the Bible calls him the father of all liars. So what are you going to receive from him? Lie upon lie upon lie upon lie. What happens to people that build their life on a lie? Well, the lie is a very poor foundation, and when the storms come, the house will come crumbling down. These are the people that always have problems, always have drama. Leviticus 20 verse 6 says, I will set my face against the person who turns to mediums and spiritists to prostitute themselves by following them. And I will cut them off from their people. This is God speaking. So here's what 
tends to happen a lot of the times. People got involved in these things many times before you come to church. Then at some point in time, you come to a place where you realize that you need salvation. You enter into salvation through a covenant with Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and you expect these things to just be gone, but they're not gone. Because you opened the door for something evil to come into your life when you did this. It doesn't run away when you get saved. It was waiting for this day to start working against you. The devil doesn't mess with unbelievers. When you mess with unbelievers, you push them to the church. Satan is not an evangelist. He doesn't want you to go to church. He wants you away from church. So the stuff that you got involved in before you were saved, it's like they're in file 13 somewhere, and the enemy is waiting for the opportunity to open that file and say, I have this against you, I have this against you, I have this, and I can use this and this and this. And that's why a lot of people get saved, and then instantly the poor poor hits the fan. A number of years ago, a young man came to one of my evening services. That night he got saved. Praise God. It's a wonderful day. The next week, he came to my service again. He said to me, he doesn't know what's going on, but all hell has broken loose in his life. From the night that he got saved, he cannot sleep. He's tormented by something. Something actually throws him, around in, uh, throws him out of bed. There's funny noises going on in his room. Um, his mind is very unclear. He's got this manic depression that doesn't want to leave him and he cannot understand and he's got pain all over his body since the day that he got saved. What's happening? Satan has had a power over him for a long time that he did not use because the timing was off. If Satan had used that against him before, that would have driven him to the church to find answers. That would have got him to call out to God and say, I've tried everything else. Now, please, what can you do to help me? But now he got saved. So what's happening? This door, this big door that was opened in his life through which something dark and evil came is still open. And now this thing says, oh, I can't handle what you're doing now. I need you away from you. This is what's going to happen. You're going to learn the hard way that if you want to follow God, you're going to suffer. I said to him, young man, we need to sit and talk because something somewhere is not right. This is not normal. And let me just say that this does not happen to everybody, but it does happen to a lot of people. And I'm sure there's some people here that can also testify that from the day that they got saved, they felt like something really bad came into their life. It wasn't from that day. It was from before. But you have to deal with it. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Some of you brought your, brought your devils with to church. The devil needs to leave and you need to stay. Amen? So, yeah, here's what happened. I sit and I speak to him, and uh, we started praying. And all I can say to you is it was mind-blowing because I, I often, I want to say I marvel at the amount of demonic powers that people can have in their life and still seem to have a semblance of a normal life. It's just mind-blowing. The first night that I prayed for this young man, I'm pretty sure we cast over 50 demons out of him. The second night, I cast even more out of him. By the time we'd cast probably 200 demons out of him, I said to him, listen, Yabut, where's this stuff coming from? This is not normal. You need to go to your family and find out what is in your bloodline because something really bad happened somewhere that allowed this amount of stuff to come into your life. His mother didn't stay in the same province. He made an appointment to go and see his mother. When he spoke to his mother, she was very hesitant to talk to him. It was almost like his mother's attitude was, let sleeping dogs lie. We don't talk about this stuff. And he had to get her to understand what's happening to him, that something really bad is going on, and he needs to find out what the story was. The story was his grandfather was, for all intents and purposes, a witch doctor. He had his grandfather's name. He inherited all the curses that was working through his grandfather. Nobody ever said anything about it. From what I can remember, his grandfather was a bit of a difficult man. And when he passed away, it was almost like the whole family went, <sighs> you know. 
So now they don't want to go touch there again. But the problem is, he inherited this family curse and all the demons that used to work through his grandfather. When we understood that, he could get help. Because you see, the Bible says, give the devil no place. Until you don't deal with the roots of what's going on in the life of an individual, they also can't be set free. Have any of you ever messed around in the garden? I'm not talking about coming home from a club drunk and then you go and do your business in the garden. I'm talking about actual gardening. Right? I know some of you. You're from the south. <laughs> When you go into the garden and you pull out a weed, you need to be sure that you grab hold of the roots because if you break off the roots, the weed is not stupid. It's actually very clever. It realizes somebody's trying to kill me and then it puts all its power into its roots and it just goes deeper and deeper and deeper. So you need to get the roots out. If you don't get the roots out, it just keeps coming back. It comes back. It comes back. In the case of this young man, when we understood what the problem was and we could take him through prayer and renunciation and confession to God and dealing with the familiar spirits that came through his grandfather, eventually things calmed down and he was helped. Now, Leviticus 20 verse 27 says, A man or a woman who is a medium or a spiritist amongst you must be put to death. You must stone them and their blood will be on their own hands. Why do we feel that it is okay for us in today's society to be involved in fortune-telling, spiritism, astrology, necromancy, whatever you want to call it, but the Word of God says that in the Old Testament, if you did these things, it was punishable by death. Then it cannot be right now. And don't come to me with this whole, oh, but that's in the Old Testament nonsense. The Word of God is the Word of God. When God says no, it's no. Let's talk about the Ten Commandments. Is it, is it okay now to covet your neighbor's wife? So you agree with me that you shouldn't. Is it okay now to lie? So you agree with me that we shouldn't. But it's in the Old Testament. Can I tell you why it's valid? Because this is how God feels about things. And when God warns us not to go there, you better not go there. You know, too many people are, oh, but I live under the grace of God. My friend, the grace of God does not cancel out disobedience to the word of God. That's just going to get you into even more trouble. We need to deal with these things. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 27 verse 18. What am I doing? I'm trying to show you how the Word of God is still practical and relevant today and why a lot of people battle and they can never go forward. For some people that's listening either over the internet or maybe here today to understand why in certain areas of your life you're stuck. God doesn't want you to be stuck. The Word of God says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope, to give you a future. Call a whole church together and ask them how many of those people feel that they are living that. You're going to be surprised. Very few are going to raise their hands. But why? Because many people are stuck somewhere. They feel they get no breakthrough. They're not going forward. In fact, they feel like they're on a slippery slope and they keep going down. That's not right. Deuteronomy chapter 27 verse 18 says, Cursed is the man who sleeps with his father's wife. For he dishonors his father's bed. Cursed is the man who has sex with any animal. Cursed is the man who sleeps with his sister, the daughter of his father, or his mother. Cursed is the man who sleeps with his mother-in-law. That's a whole bunch of curses, all surrounding one topic. What is it? Sexual immorality. My friends, one of the biggest reasons why a lot of people are completely stuck and they cannot go forward in life is because they have been exposed to some form of sexual immorality. So yes, these curses all have one thing in common. It's called sex. Apparently, we're not allowed to talk about that in the church. If I don't talk about it, I can't help you. Amen. 
So let me share with you a very interesting experience that I had also a number of years ago. A gentleman comes to me after one of our meetings. He says to me he would like to talk to me because he feels like something is wrong in his life. We start talking. He says to me that he has a problem. He feels like he cannot pray. And he feels like he cannot read the Bible. And even if he does read the Bible, the Bible makes no sense to him. He gets nothing from it. He's looking for answers. He wants God to talk to him. There's just nothing. Okay. So we sat in a bit of counseling. I asked him about any doors that he might have opened to the enemy. You must understand that it is in Satan's best interest for the word of God not to speak to you. Because the word of God is light. Satan is the prince of darkness. He hates the light. You will be surprised how many people are sitting in church today on this Sunday and the word of God being preached means nothing to them because the darkness has covered them and it doesn't let the light come through. And until they don't deal with that darkness that they open themselves up to, the light can't come through. So this man, he can't read Bible, he can't pray, he battles. And then something interesting happens. We start talking about doorways, etc., etc. And very nervously, I might add, he eventually confesses to me that he had slept with a prostitute. You know about Murphy's Law. Apparently, Murphy's Law was very applicable to his life because not only did he sleep with a prostitute, the prostitute was also a Sangoma, <laughs> which made things a hell of a lot worse. How did I know that? I'm going to tell you how it came about. So when I heard that, I said to him, look, but, uh, you must understand something. You have a soul tie with this person. It's very evil, and it's a doorway for evil spirits to come in. And obviously, these things don't want you to grow. Obviously, these things don't want you to become stronger in the things of the Lord. And probably these things are working against you. So we started praying. I led him through a prayer to confess what he did, to renounce what he did, etc., etc. And the next moment, this demon begins to manifest through him. I never saw anything like this in my life before. I wish that I had a video camera there that day because you will all think that I'm lying or exaggerating, but I promise you that I'm not. This man's entire, his features began to change. His eyes became like that of a serpent. You know, a serpent, the pupils are not round. They're these little... His eyes became like that. It looked like a light came on behind his eyes. His tongue began to come out. Now, look, I mean, the human tongue can maybe come out that long. This oaks came out that long. And it started going like a snake. So it went like, you know. And his neck began to get thicker and thicker and thicker. That it began to resemble that of a cobra, that of a serpent. I tell you what, I needed prayer because after what I saw there, I was like, what? It's amazing how that motivates you to pray. <laughs> You know, the Bible says pray without ceasing. When you see this stuff, you understand you have to pray. So anyway, we pray, we pray, we pray, we pray, we pray. Eventually, I asked the demon, who are you and where did you come from? And the demon actually confessed that he came through this man's sexual relations with that woman. But then the demon went on and so said to me that the woman was in fact a practicing sangoma. And that he had invited those powers to come into his life. And the thing laughed. It told me this man must not think that he will ever get anywhere because it is their mission to destroy him totally. They did not. That day God, by his grace, delivered that man and set him free. And I do believe that he learned a very, very expensive lesson about kafufling with the wrong things, you know, there's a nice song in Afrikaans, laat staan, sikke dinge laat staan, okay? Better not get involved, stay away. But where did this come from? The Word of God says a curse will come upon you for sexual immorality. We are living in the 20th century. And these things might have been penned down in the 3rd or the 4th century, but that changes nothing of the validity 
of the scriptures. What God said in his word still comes to pass. What God warned us about is still relevant and we need to take this to heart. And we need to understand that if we have messed with this stuff, we need to do something to deal with it. A young man comes to see me for prayer. Him and his wife had been married for roughly, I think it was two or three years. Very sheepishly, he had to confess to me that there was big problems in the bedroom department. It was not the kind of problems that you would expect from a young man because he had started suffering with impotence. Impotence can sometimes touch you, especially when you get a bit older, etc., and the testosterone is not there anymore, what, what, what. But you would really not expect to see that in a young man that is probably in his late 20s. So I began to talk to him and I asked him some questions. Here's what transpired. About six months before, he had visited, I do believe it was Japan, one of the countries in the Orient. And um, one of his friends that went with him on a business trip convinced him to go and see a specific temple. This temple was dedicated to a god of virility and sexual power and stamina and what, what, what. In order to go there, they had to take off their shoes and they had to bow to show respect to the power, whatever that was there. But now what does the Bible say? Do not make for yourselves graven images of anything, blah, blah, blah. Do not bow down to them. Do not worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. He's a Christian. He's walking into the temple of a false god, specifically working in the area of sexual virility. What is he doing? He's bringing himself under a curse. In what area does the demon work? In the area of sexual virility. So what did the devil do? <coughs> Took his power. Nothing worked. What did he have to do? He had to go down on his knees. He had to confess to God that that was a sin. He had to repent of it. He had to renounce whatever powers came upon him. He had to say sorry, but very, very sorry. And he had to trust God to deliver him. He got delivered that day. He got set free. They now have two children. I do believe the problem was solved. Amen? Amen? Let's talk about how, how am I going to term this? It's not, it's, it is sexual immorality, but you know what? It's, it's this whole thing in, 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 in society today that I sleep, yeah, I sleep there, I sleep there, I sleep there, and everything is fine. It's just okay. What would I call that? Promiscuity. Thank you. Let's talk about sexual promiscuity. You know, the Bible says that Satan is perfect in wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now, one thing you cannot accuse the devil of is being stupid because he's not. Even the Word of God tells us he's perfect in wisdom. Not one of you are. He's much wiser than you and he's much wiser than me. He knows how to mess with people. He knows how to get you to open doors. Society has come to a place where we no longer really honor the Word of God, that one husband will stay with one wife and you don't mess around and you don't covet your neighbor's wife, etc., etc. So a lot of people have become very loose when it comes to their sexual um, experiences. One of the easiest ways for evil spirits to transfer between people is through sexual contact. Because the Bible warns us, don't you know that when you sleep with a prostitute, the two of you become one? You're supposed to become one with your wife. You're supposed to become one with your husband. When you become one with another person, you are still becoming one, and it forms a soul tie. Now, later on in this series, I will actually give a whole teaching on soul ties, which is not today's purpose. It's just for you to understand. You know, back in the day, we used to go jawling. We used to go, all of us, yeah, most of us. We hopped from this club to that club to that club to that club. 
But unfortunately, some people used to hop from this girl to that girl, from this boy to that boy, and that's a big problem. And you know what? I remember vividly when I was younger, listening to the guys boast, ah, oh, no, he scored with this one and he scored with that one. Let me tell you something, you didn't score at all. You messed up your life. Because by that joining of the two souls, whatever was in that boy or that girl's life that could bring destruction, Satan would instantly transfer it to your life. And it's easy. Because you're opening that door. I had a friend. Well, I, we're still friends. Many years ago, um, there was a lady that attended my church. And she had a boy that when we grew up, he was always a little bit strange. He was always a little bit weird. Listen to me. You can't tell me nothing about ADD or ADHD because if you spend five minutes with this oak, he would drive you up the walls. He was four years, no, yeah, I think four years old. He was four years old when his mother actually had to take him to the University of Bloemfontein for them to study him because the doctors had never seen anything like it in their lives. He, he, was, he was just completely out of control, which later it turned out was because of demonic problems in his life, demons. One of the characteristics of demonic infestation is total restlessness because demons can't rest. They always drive you. They always compel you. They always enslave you. They're always busy charging you up because when you get no sleep, they suck the life out of you. So in any case, this young man became involved in Satanism. And in a way, I feel like it wasn't necessarily as much by his choice as by the fact that he was born with a lot of demons in his life that wanted to take him down that path. Regardless, he got involved in Satanism. And in Satanism, they realized very quickly that he had the gift of the gab and he had, he had the right moves and what, what, what. The girls used to fall for him, hook, line, and sinker. His mission was to go as often as possible and to have sexual relations with as many girls as possible for the evil that lived in him to be transferred to them, most of the girls that he slept with got involved in Satanism. Why? Because they received the seed of the satanic movement through what happened between him and them. Now, here is a true, true story of how this used to work with him. And I know that because when I prayed for him and he went through the period of deliverance, all of these things came out. When he was about 16 years old, at one of the rituals that was done to him, a spirit guide appeared to him. It is a demon that has a close relationship with the person that they work with. And this demon appeared to him, he used to call it the ball of slime. It literally looked like a ball of slime that came bouncing, bouncing. Nobody else could see it, but he could see it, and it would speak to him. And it would come to him, and it would say, that girl there. This is what she likes to eat. This is what she likes to drink. This is her favorite song. It would give him all sorts of information about her. So when he went there to talk to her, this girl was like blown away. Like, oh, how do you know all of the stuff? But you see, he was very smooth in the way that he did things. So very soon her knees went weak and she was like all, you know, and eventually there was problems for this girl. But it was because of the spirit that was in him. A lot of people used to like to hang around him because he would tell them all sorts of stuff about their life. Unfortunately, you've got to pay the devil for that stuff. He didn't know nothing about nobody. A spirit that worked in him knew a lot about a lot of people. How does that work? Let's talk about it. Everybody has a guardian angel. We like to hear that. But what if I was to tell you that everybody has some demons in their life as well? If God is going to assign an angel to look after you and try and help you to get to the place where God wants you to be, you must understand that the devil is also very busy. So he's assigned somebody to your life. That thing's purpose is for you to get off the rails, mess up, do as many wrong things as possible, give the devil place, etc., etc. And this is where the problem comes in. 
Because you see, the spirit world knows you. The spirit world knows what you've done, where you've been, what you got up to. The spirit know, world also knows your hopes, your fears, your dreams, your aspirations. When you go to a fortune teller, they operate through familiar spirits like the spirit that used to work with this young man. And that spirit communicates with whatever is working in your life. And in a second, they can actually know everything about your life. So they just start telling you. But it's easy. If I walk with Matthew into a place, and I go and I sit and I talk to somebody and I say, oh, this is who he is, this is what he does. That person comes in, oh, okay, you this, you that, you what. It's not difficult, is it? This is how the spirit world works. And then comes the destruction. By the grace of God, this young man got delivered. I saw something when we prayed for him in deliverance that I'd never, ever, ever seen before. And I've seen a lot of things. When one of these spirits came out of him, and I can't really remember exactly which one it was, but I think it was the, the main spirit that was at work behind the whole uh, satanic movement, etc., etc. When this thing came out of him, his whole demeanor changed. I don't know if you've ever seen these big lizards. They, they, um, what are they called? Um, you know these big lizards? They, they're actually um, poisonous. When they bite you, you die. K Komodo dragon. Do you know that this man, when, I, when, when, this was, when, when we helped him to deal with all of this stuff, he was about 25 years old. When that thing manifested in him, his whole body, and it, it's, it's very difficult to understand, but you have to see it for yourself. He began to take on all the characteristics of that type of lizard. The way his eyes moved, the way his tongue came out, the way his body. You know, a lizard has a specific way of moving. His whole body began to move like a, he started climbing the walls. God is my witness. If Hollywood did that, you'd all say that, oh, that was very poor special effect. I saw it happen myself. I didn't see it once. I saw it happen twice. I saw a woman that was involved in Satanism and all sorts of other stuff as well that had the spirit of Hanu, I think it's Hanuman. Would you know maybe? The monkey god? When that spirit manifested in that woman, she started climbing the walls. I kid you not. But how are they doing that? It's because of a supernatural power that works through them that they need to be set free of. He got set free. God helped him. God changed his life. Um, the next time, and I'm not just talking to you, I'm talking to a couple of people here that's going to be listening to this. The next time you think that you're scoring by sleeping around, please remember that you're not scoring. Because you can't see what exactly you are joining your soul to. If you could see what you were joining your soul to, you might have a heart attack right there on the spot. Satan loves sexual promiscuity. Because how many people's lives has he destroyed because of 10 minutes of fleshly pleasure? Matthew chapter 18 verse 34 to 35 says... And his master was angry and delivered him to the tormentors until he should pay back all that was due unto him. So my heavenly father will also do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother. This passage of scripture speaks about bitterness and unforgiveness. Let me tell you something. The church is full of bitter people. And the church is full of people that refuse to forgive because they feel justified to hate somebody for what they did. But let me, let me help you to understand something. You cannot experience the forgiveness of God upon your life if you are not willing to forgive from your side. And I'm not trying to say that what was done to you or what happened to you or what was said about you was not bad. But I want to say something to you. You are the reason why you can't go forward. Because if you cannot forgive the people that have hurt you, you also cannot be forgiven by God for what you have done. It's like a package deal. To receive forgiveness from God, I must give forgiveness to mankind. I must forgive people. So, <clears throat> I have shared this quite a few times. But 
for the purpose of this teaching, it's very important for me to share this. I was preaching in a small little town in the Free State. They carried a woman into the church. Two men carried her. She could not walk. Afterwards, I asked people to come forward if they want to receive prayer. They carry the woman to the front. They're holding her up. I asked this lady what's wrong. She gives me like a whole encyclopedia of infirmities and problems that she's battling with. I said, okay, fine. I'm going to pray for you. And as I'm about to pray for her, I get this thing in my heart that this woman is very bitter. So I said to her, I said, ma'am, I have this thing in my heart that you are very bitter about something and you've not let it go. Instantly, this woman's entire countenance changes. You see this fieriness come into her. You literally see the hatred coming out of her eyes. And she says, yes, I hate them. I hate them. I will never forgive them. This is now the way she responds. I said to her, ma'am, did you come here for prayer today? She says, yes. I said, God can't help you. Oh, how can I say something like that? I said, because according to the word of God, Right now, you are being tormented by tormenting spirits, and you are giving them the place. Until you don't stop what you're doing, God cannot help you. This might be as a shock for some of you, but there's many people that will never be healed, that will never be delivered, not because God is incapable of healing them, not because God is incapable of delivering them, because they will not meet God's conditions. You have to be willing to forgive if you want forgiveness. God will not tell the tormenting spirits in your life to go if you haven't removed what keeps calling them. Okay, this might be a gross way to think about it, but it'll help you to understand. If a dog comes running into this church and does his business there on the carpet, it's not going to be very nice. But it's going to get even worse because the flies are going to come from everywhere because they're being called by the filth that sits there. It doesn't help we all sit and complain about the flies. Somebody must take away the filth that keeps calling them. Now, your bitterness and your unforgiveness is like doggy doo-doo that keeps calling the flies. And it doesn't help you complain about it. You've got to remove that which keeps calling them to come. Tormenting spirits are called by bitterness and unforgiveness. And you can't get rid of them because that gives them the place. Okay. I explained this to the woman. She looks at me with these big eyes. I said to her, ma'am, would you agree with me that you are suffering? She says, yes. I said, well, you're the only one that can stop your suffering. You need to come to a place that you let these people go. She said, okay, fine. I prayed with her. She confessed to God her bad attitude, her bitterness. And let me just say what made this a hundred times worse was that the people that did this to her were people in the church. Isn't that just the way it always is? The devil would rather have you hurt in the church than by somebody in the world because you kind of like maybe expect that from worldly people, but you don't expect that from the church. But let me just tell you that not everybody sitting in the church is truly a child of God. There are many agents of Satan that also sit in the church. She forgave them. I prayed for her. The power of the Holy Spirit came upon this woman. Her whole body began to shake. She shaked so, so violently that the two men couldn't hold her. She was down on the floor. This woman at that stage was probably in her mid-60s. This continued for maybe, I don't know, half an hour. I did not interfere. When God's busy, I just leave him to do what he's doing. When she eventually calmed down, I walked up to her. I extended my hand. She got up by herself. Okay, I helped her, but she stood, which she couldn't do before. She took a deep breath. I said to her, how are you feeling? She said she feels like a completely different person. She said to me, she's got no pain in her body. She was riddled with pain. But where was the pain coming from? Tormenting spirits. They weren't there anymore. If I take a needle, and I keep shoving it into Wilson, he's going to keep feeling pain, and he's going to keep complaining, and the only way for that to stop is to get rid of either the needle or myself, and immediately he'll feel, he'll feel better. Well, that's exactly what happened to her. Now,
I prayed for a, a young woman who had a very bad experience growing up with her parents. Her mother and her father were very abusive. Her father was an alcoholic. The mother really just didn't care about her, used to treat her in the most horrible way and exposed them to a lot of very, very bad and very, very wrong things. We came to a place that she needed to forgive her mother. What I'm sharing with you now is 100% the truth, and this happened in my lounge. As first, it took weeks to get her to a place that she would even contemplate forgiving them. You know, God had to help her a lot with forgiveness in her heart. Eventually, she came to a place where she said, fine, I'm ready. I'm willing to forgive her. As I led her through a prayer, to started in a prayer for her to forgive her parents, I heard a scream. She showed me her arm. It looked like a knife had cut her all the way from the top to the bottom, blood running everywhere. What was happening? The same spirits that were tormenting her day and night were now manifesting in a very practical way their presence because they did not want her to forgive her mother because the moment she forgives her mother, they will lose their victim. Remember something, demons have one purpose. Outside of God, there is no life, and the way for them to experience life in any way is to attach to a person and suck the life out of that person. And they don't like to lose. Uh, Jesus said, if an evil spirit goes from a man, it goes through the barren, dry places, it seeks rest, it finds none. Then it says to itself, I will go back to my house. The demon sees the person as the house. Now they're not happy because they're going to get evicted. By the time this demon, there was probably more than one. There was actually quite a few. By the time these things left her, most of her body had cut marks all over. But then you must also take into account that she'd been walking with this absolute phenomenal hatred and bitterness towards her family for probably 29 years. The Bible says, give the devil no place. Sometimes we give him a lot of place. And let me say something about the devil, because some people seem to not understand that. In the book of um, Revelation chapter 12, we read about a war that took place in the heavenly realm. A war between Michael and his angels, and Lucifer and his angels. They He's actually called the dragon. And the Bible says, And Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. Don't expect the devil to go without a fight. It's not biblical. The Bible tells us he fights back. That's why a lot of people battle, because they don't want to go through that battle. They want it to be easy. It's not always easy. If you've given place to the devil, sometimes you're going to battle to break that hold. But you've got to continue because God is for you, not against you. He wants you to be the head, not the tail. God will help you. But sometimes we're suffering the consequences of what we allow to come into our lives. She got delivered. It stopped. The cuts in her body healed. The most important thing was that her heart had to heal as well. A man comes to me after a church service. He says to me, please can I pray for him because he has debilitating headaches to the point that sometimes when he gets these headaches, he actually falls into a trance and then his wife battles with him. It takes time for him to come out of it and then for two or three days, he can't do anything. It's really, really bad. Upon some discussion, I say to him, I'll come to your house and I'll come and pray for you there. Now, (laughs) it turns out that this man is a Reiki master. He spends a lot of time doing healing and what, what, what for other people, etc., etc. Now, let's be very, very honest. There is such a thing as supernatural healing. But the only source of healing is God. 
there's no other way where you're going to get supernatural healing. When you go to the devil to get healing or deliverance or any kind of help whatsoever, you're going to have to pay him for that. The ultimate thing that he's looking for is your soul. But he will definitely settle for your health or your peace or your sanity or your hope or your joy. He wants something in return. So I get to this man's house. He lived here in the south of Joburg. And uh, as I walk into the house, there's like, uh, there's Buddhas everywhere. There's uh, crystals everywhere. There's like, like a whole plethora of, call it new age type, Hindu type, what, what stuff. All these things he uses to channel the energy so that he could bring healing to these people. But now look at how the devil works. In his mind, he's helping people. And he gave me a whole list of he's helped this one and he's done this and he's done that. And I'm not doubting that. But what God does through me or what God does through you when it's the Holy Spirit doesn't cost me nothing. For him, it's costing him his life. His kidneys were on the verge of seizing up. The doctor told him that if things don't change, he would have to go on to dialysis. There was a whole bunch of other health-related issues. So now, he's bringing healing to these people, but he has no health for himself. How does that work? Because that's not the way God works. Anyway, so I said to him, look, now I, I must be very honest, he was not really a Christian. He came to one of my meetings because somebody that they knew very well had encountered the power of the Holy Spirit at a meeting, went and told him all about it. And because he's curious about these things, he came to see how does this work. And that day, the power of the Holy Spirit arrested him in the church and a lot of things happened. So that's why he opened the door for me to go to his house and talk to him. Because of the power of God that he experienced in the church, he listened to what I had to say. So I said to him, sir, you must understand the Bible says you, uh, we cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and mammon. If you really want to serve God, you've got to get rid of all this stuff because this is against the word of God. In fact, the Bible says when you bring these things into your house, you will curse yourself. He looks at me with his big eyes. It was a very big decision for him because Reiki had been a very, very big part of his life for many, many years. And he felt he was doing good. You see, at, at, at the core of his being, he was actually a very good person because he wanted to help other people. But he didn't realize that he was actually just making things worse. He made a decision that day. He said, okay, so he wants all this stuff to go. True story. I say to him, if you want the stuff to go, all these things need to go out of your house today. Otherwise, you're going to have problems. Okay, fine. He walks up to the first crystal. As he picks it up to start walking out of the house, it looks like he turns into the proverbial pillar of salt. Everything in him just went like all rigid and stuff. When I walked up to him, there was a tear running down his one eye. Eventually, after me praying for him, he told me that he has a headache unlike he's ever had in his life. It's so bad, it's paralyzed him. I had to pray for him and pray for him and pray for him and pray for him. I had to bind all the stuff eventually. Normally, I don't do it, but this day I did because I could see that he was battling. I actually carried most of the stuff out of his house myself. That day, he got delivered from a whole bunch of demons that was working through him. When we got to the main demon that was working through him, when the demon manifested, it had him sit in, I don't know if you know the lotus position where they cross their legs and they go, and they're like, um. And yeah, this thing is sitting there, umming and umming, <laughs> umming and eyeing. And I asked the demon, I said, who are you? He says, I am the power that works through him. It's not the power of God. It's demonic. It's evil. It's destructive. That day, God healed this man. The power of the Holy Spirit set him free. Let me remind you, Jesus says in his word, I have come to set the captives free. I have come to heal the brokenhearted. 
because this man was willing to lay down these things. You know, he showed me one crystal. I'm not exaggerating. He told me he paid 30,000 rand for that crystal. This was in the 90s. What would he have paid for it now? It was like that. I asked him, what's the purpose of the crystal? No, it's to fine-tune the harmonics and the this and the that and the what, what. The Holy Spirit doesn't need none of that stuff. He knows what to do. God is your creator. He doesn't need these extra things to, if, if you don't have this and you don't have that and you don't have that, listen to me carefully. All we need is prayer of faith. God still heals the sick. People can still be delivered and set free. The problem is we never want to talk about these things because people get upset. It's not just the people that get upset. It's the religious spirits that go to church that don't want to be told the truth. But we got to hear the truth. Amen? So I see there that I'm rapidly running out of time. I want to ask you a question. Does it help you to hear the scripture and then see how it practically manifested and worked in the life of a, an individual. Then these things are important for us to talk about. Because a lot of people don't realize why they can't seem to buy a break. Why everything is always going wrong. Why in certain areas of their life they just can't seem to break free. People need to understand how the word of God practically works in the lives of individuals. My friends, I'm not sharing this to give glory to the devil. The devil gets no glory from this. I'm sharing this to give glory to God because I'm trying to show you that God's word is truth. And if we apply it correctly, it brings healing. It brings restoration. The Bible says, is not my word like a fire? Is not my word like a hammer? The devil doesn't like the word of God because the word of God is a fire that in certain respects begin to burn against the origin, the root cause of the problems that people sit with, but then they must first hear the truth. In most churches, you have some religious spirit that sits there that says, oh, I don't like to hear this. Oh, this gives glory to the devil. Oh, this is not from God. Oh, it doesn't work like that, says who? You've got 10 people around you that experience it that way, but for you it doesn't work that way. The truth will always be the truth. And only the truth can set the captives free. So, why are we talking about these things? Because it's relevant. Because it's real. Because people are still affected by these things. And when people can understand how this works, they can apply the truth correctly. The Word of God makes it plain that the Word is actually the sword of the Spirit. In other words, when you come into a, a, a battle with the enemy, what is it? What is your weapon? Let's, let's, I've got two minutes. We've got the armor of God, which we know the armor of God is only useful in times of war. I mean, you're not going to go to a party with your full regalia, what, what, you know. But when you're in war, you need your helmet, you need your breastplate, you need your belt, you need your shoes, you need your shield, you need your sword. But what is the sword? The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. But sometimes it's specific scriptures and an under, a specific understanding of the Word of God to be able to come against the works of darkness so that there can be freedom. The devil doesn't want certain things to be spoken in the church because that will become the sword of the Spirit. That will begin to set the captives free. That will release people from bondage and Satan loves people in bondage. Don't think that everybody that's sitting in a church today all over the world on this Sunday are completely free. The Bible says to the believer, look at your neighbor and say, that's you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That was not written to the unbeliever. That was written to the believer. It is to the believer that the word of God says, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour whom you must resist standing firm in your faith. Ladies and gentlemen, if we can come to the place that we understand these things and that we apply them, 
the world is going to become a much, much better place. We will begin to experience the power of God in the church once again because it was never the heart of God for that to stop. You know, the principle of discipleship was Jesus teaches the disciples. They begin to learn from him and they apply the principles he taught them. They apply the word of God correctly and they then teach the next generation. They then teach the next generation and none of this should ever have stopped. But it did. And I'll tell you why, because there was pressure for it to stop. And that pressure comes from Satan. Every time a captive is set free, heaven rejoices. Satan is miffed because he's losing power. And he doesn't like that, so he's going to try and put pressure for this to stop. Did anybody learn something today? Give the Lord a big hand, please. Okay, so regarding the message that I'm speaking about today and regarding the type of things that we, we're talking about, Jesus came to set the captives free. But in order for you to be able to be set free, the following things have to happen. The Bible says, confess your sin one to another. God is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 verse 9, if I remember correctly. So there needs to be confession because without confession, there cannot be cleansing. The Bible also makes it clear that we must forgive others their trespasses. Why is that important? Because tormenting spirits will not leave until you don't conf uh, confess and repent and forgive. There has to be repentance because some people like the problems that they brought into their lives. Repentance means I renounce, I lay it down, I turn my back on it, I don't want this anymore. And once we've come to a place that we've fulfilled the criteria, then there can be deliverance, there can be healing, etc., etc. I'm going to share this prayer with you. I'm going to pray it over you. And whoever wants to listen to the, or use this is more than welcome to do so. <clears throat> for those that would like to pray to God for Him to deliver them or to set them free, you can join with me in praying the following prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you are the only God, the only way to God, and that you died that I might live. I believe you are the healer. I believe you are the redeemer. I believe you are my Savior, and I believe you conquered Satan on the cross of Calvary. I confess today every doorway that I have opened to Satan. I confess any and all sexual immorality, doorways I have opened through my inquisitiveness, in the spirit world, outside of God, any witchcraft, any sorcery, exposure to spiritism, fortune-telling, divination, any form of necromancy. I renounce all spirit guides that I've called into my life by these things. I also confess, Lord, any weakness in my family bloodline that has opened the door for Satan to torment me. I confess all my bitterness, my resentment, my unforgiveness towards my fellow man, including that I have towards myself in accordance with your word. I forgive those who have sinned against me, who have harmed me, who have wronged me, and I lay down all my anger, my bitterness, my resentment, and my unforgiveness. I now renounce all power that I gave the enemy by these things, and I lay down whatever power I gave. 
I choose life. I choose Christ. I choose healing. I choose restoration by the power of the blood of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, that today you set this captive free. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen.